So please join me in giving a massive Kiwi welcome to the chaser, the dark destroyer, Sean Wallace. Just another day at the office. Sean Wallace, the dark destroyer, barrister by day, celebrity quizzer by night. He draws in crowds. He's paid for his own cost to get to Aotearoa for a holiday and also to raise money for charities across the country. Sean Wallace, the dark destroyer. Thank you. Tonight, he's fundraising for Sir John Walker's charity. I love watching The Chase, and Sean Wallace is my favourite chaser, so... Are you here with a quiz too? Uh, with a very competitive table, yes. And what do you love most about Sean? Um, his wit and um, just level of intellect, he's great. I don't know how, he, how he's ended up here and been able to support um, you know, a couple of people like this in this way, but um, it's got a feel-good factor and just here to, pleased to be here and support it, yeah. He loves connecting with people. He's generous with his time. How long does that actually take to film? And knowing that you are a great admirer of this person and a, and a wonderful mimic of him, could you answer as Michael Caine? It normally takes about two hours to film. And uh, obviously uh, the reason why it takes two hours is because Bradley goes on and on and on. The nights include a kai, a kōrero, and most importantly, quizzing. Some of the best teams across Aotearoa have signed up to meet the master. I really appreciate you coming to Aotearoa, New Zealand, and using your platform to fundraise and help our communities. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to do a little bit of a warm-up with you, so I just want to see if you've heard of these well-known Māori. So, number one is, have you heard of Lee Tamahori? No. He's a James Bond director. That was the last film uh, starring Pierce Brosnan, with um, Halle Berry playing Jinx Johnson. Yeah. Madonna was in it. Yes, sir. Have you heard of Winton Rufa? Winton Rufa played in the 1982 World Cup uh, for New Zealand. Yes, I've heard of him. Okay, what about Taika Waititi? Uh, he is an Oscar-winning director who's married to Rita Ora. Yeah. What about Kiri Te Kanoa? Kiri Te Kanoa, the great opera singer who sung at uh, Prince Charles and Lady Diana Spencer's wedding on the 29th of July, 1981. Wow. I think you, you know all of Te Ao Māori now. <laughs> um, you've said that you... Uh, prefer being a goal model, not a role model. Can you just explain? Yeah, that? the reason by that is that, you know, people have a tendency to um, deify their heroes and put them on a pedestal. Yeah. Uh, but uh, like any human being, we all make mistakes. And as I say, if you put somebody on a pedestal, uh, the fall from grace can be swift and unrelenting yeah. um, if you do make mistakes. And sometimes the press and the public can be unforgiving. Yeah. So I like to basically call myself a goal model in terms of the goals and, and um, challenges that I set for myself that people can actually be inspired to and hopefully surpass those achievements I made. And I'm comfortable being closer to the floor. For a lot of people around the world, for like Māori like us or people of colour, like you're our man when we watch The Chase. So what's it like being a representative for all of us? It's, it's, it's wonderful and it basically goes to show that, uh, you know, for, for years that uh, people of colour have been put down in terms of their supposed lack of intellectual ability. Mm. And I like to demonstrate that, you know, black people do have the capacity as our white counterparts. So whether you're black, uh, Maori uh, or any other ethnic grouping, we still have the same intellectual capacity uh, as our white counterparts. And as I say, we've uh, created uh, um, and invented and made a co positive contribution to world history. And sometimes that's been sort of airbrushed out of history by, uh, uh, you know, uh, the white colonials, for want of a better expression. So I'm proud to be that representative in terms of demonstrating that people of colour do have that same intellectual capacity as our white counterparts. Just touching on that, um, yeah, we actually are having conversations about colonisation in New Zealand at the moment. Good. I, was, I was just wondering if, if people in England uh, have those discussions around... Yeah, we do. Yeah. Uh, and uh, it's important to actually you know, bring that to the forefront. We, we're seeing that in the Caribbean in relation to um, uh, a vast majority of Cari Caribbean nations now claiming to be independent from the Crown. Yeah. Uh, and to actually seek reparations in relation to the sort of colonisation of the Caribbean uh, um, mm. uh, states and nations. Uh, and, uh, you know, whilst you can't rewrite history or, you know, unscramble time, I think it's important uh, that uh, white colonial powers, be it Britain, France, or other European powers which used to dominate uh, the world, should recognise uh, what they've done in terms of uh, uh, trying to actually um, suppress uh, our culture. Uh, and uh, where necessary, uh, to pay the, you know, the necessary repar uh, reparations, I think. 
And uh, you actually made a trip to the Caribbean, didn't you? I did, because uh, that was part of uh, my DNA journey. And it was wonderful for me to actually uh, be able to be in a position, courtesy of our TV, of course, to be tracing my ancestry, which went back to, uh, you know, the mid 17th century. Hi, Diane. Hi, my darlings. Ah. So this is a great house. Yes, it is. This is it. Hmm? Isn't that beautiful? Beautiful, How? but obviously what it stood for and represented, obviously that beauty is somewhat tarnished and forever will be, won't it? And to actually see uh, that my uh, grandmother six times removed, you know, was a slave. And I'm sure that she's looking down on me from the heavens, you know, proud of what I've achieved in relation to my career and uh, life thus far. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I've always been proud to be black, uh, always proud of my heritage. If you were to come to my house, I've got a mural on my wall called My Inspiration. Mm -hmm. So as a young uh, a black kid growing up, uh, I was proud to be uh, black, despite the fact that in the 1960s in Britain, mm. you know, uh, we suffered over racism. Mm. Uh, so people like Pelé, who's a three-time FIFA World Cup winner, Muhammad Ali, mm. uh, people like Gary Sobers, who hit six sixes, the first person to do so, Jesse Owens, who defied uh, the so-called racial supremacy of uh, uh, Nazi Germany by winning four Olympic gold medals, mm. uh, uh, Harriet Tubman. These are people who I looked up to who made a positive contribution uh, by virtue of what they believed in, uh, by virtue of their talent, by virtue of their intellectual prowess, but were black, just like me. So to see that um, made me feel uh, proud to be black. And um, I used to think that when I was a little kid, when I saw what these people have achieved in life, uh, if I could have a fraction of what they've achieved, then I'm going to be a success in my life. Mm. And I think, as I say, with fame does come responsibility. And uh, I think you should use your fame in an altruistic way to try and help others rather than be selfish and introverted in trying to keep it to yourself. When you were at school, uh, a teacher once said to you you were going to be packing shelves or in prison. Did you ever get a, an apology from that teacher? No, and I didn't want an apology. Uh, and it's not nice to hear that uh, uh, because, as I say, 40, years, 40 to 50 years ago, yeah. education standards had a low expectation of people of colour. If you're a young black boy growing up, they expected you to either drive buses, work in a factory, or sadly be engaged in the criminal justice system. People ask what's changed now in uh, uh, 2023. If you're a young black girl, they expect you to either work in a typing pool or living in a high-rise council project uh, flat with loads of children running around your ankles with no visible man to support them. Mm. Uh, and any dreams or ambitions of being a doctor, a lawyer or a dentist were seen as a complete anathema. And I, when I was 12 years old, I wrote uh, to the bar council uh, because uh, it told me what I needed to achieve uh, in terms of getting those uh, qualifications. And I get that letter as a source of inspiration. Yeah. And you know, you have that rite of passage just before you do your first set of exams, you've got to go and see a careers teacher. Yeah. Uh, and uh, they ask you what you want to be. And I remember she said to me in a cold, dismissive way when I showed her the letter, you, a lawyer, at best, yeah. you're going to end up working in a factory, but somebody like you is going to end up in prison. Yeah. But to be told that yeah. as a young boy uh, was... Um, Disappointing to say but the very least. But the one thing I was determined that nobody was going to control my destiny. Yeah. But the only way I could ensure that was to make sure I had an educated mind. What did your um, parents or family think about your rise in, in the field of law and in television? Oh, they're very, very proud and they're very, very supportive. You know, when I told my mum and dad that I wanted to be a lawyer, you know, they gave me all the support and encouragement that um, I, I needed. And, you know, I've had setbacks in life. That's why I wrote an autobiography called Chasing the Dream. And I, I document that in uh, graphic terms in relation to, uh, you know, the exams I failed. Yeah. It took me four times to pass a level English language. And I remember 43 years ago when my friends were going off to university and my grades weren't high enough, I felt a failure. You know, when I got called to the bar on the 27th of November, 1984, to this day, it is still the proudest achievement of my life. Mm. Because as an 11 year old boy, that's what I was going to do. Yeah. And that's what I achieved. So a lot of my our friends here, uh, they're, they're lawyers, they're Māori lawyers, and they work, you know, in that system where a lot of the system works against Māori. We go into prison, we get spat out. I'm just yeah. wondering, is it ever uh, taxing on you to see people of colour always going in, and it's kind of course it of, is. Yeah. Uh, as I say, you, you know, uh, as I say, uh, back in England, it's, uh, there's a disproportionate number of young black males who are serving in the prison system, and of course it's not right. Uh, and the, there is that sort of unconscious bias. There is that uh, institutional racism, mm. which sadly uh, uh, permeates throughout uh, the criminal justice system, especially in relation to the police. I don't know if you've heard about that in England, uh, where they've been uh, um, charged and. Uh, um, deemed institutionally racist. Yeah. We need to actually get those numbers down and that takes education in relation to places like uh, the police force to actually realise that we do live in a multicultural, multiracial society 
whereby uh, uh, the views of one people shouldn't be disrespected by virtue of you being a member of a particular social grouping or a particular cultural group. Are, are people getting their heads around institutional racism in the UK? Uh, we've all, we, we've yeah. been aware of it for a long time. I mean, uh, 30 years ago was the death of Steve, Stephen Lawrence. I don't know if you remember uh, the racist murder of that young bo uh, uh, boy and the wonderful campaigning efforts made by his parents in relation to uh, um, you know, their dogged determination uh, broke down those barriers uh, and, uh, you know, basically uh, through the first report, which was published in 1998, um, finally uh, recognised the fact that, uh, you know, the police institution mm. is institutionally racist. So we're having conversations here about the like, abolition of prisons. So I was just wanting to get your thoughts on that. Abolition of prisons? Yeah, like, yeah. Do, uh, okay. do prisons work or...? Uh, Prisons do work because they're there to actually deter. And as I yeah. say, there are a, a type of offenders who deserve to go to prison because of the nature of the crimes they commit. Yeah. We, we shouldn't create a system whereby um, uh, uh, offenders go in and out of prison. Yeah. Uh, and I think prisons need to be, be properly invested in terms of preparing prisoners uh, for their eventual release in society. Now, I go into a lot of prisons because I think it's important using my public profile to basically go into prisons to basically say to these prisoners, look, eventually you will be released. Mm -hmm. And it's important that you're given the sort of support uh, to realise that uh, you can be reintegrated into society mm -hmm. uh, and you can still make a positive contribution irrespective of that blot on your landscape. And uh, society and history has been riddled with people who have gone to prison and have managed to turn their life around and have made a positive contribution. Welcome back. Sean Wallace has paid his own way to Aotearoa to support some awesome causes. On the weekend, he was in Heretaunga, Hawke's Bay, fundraising for the Cyclone Relief Fund, and then in Whanganui Atara, Poneke, raising money for Lifelight. Tomorrow night, he's in my birthplace, in Vicargo, for you flying Southland, before he wraps in Kaiapoi on Thursday. Hikurangi Kamiora Jackson turns quizmaster. Hello, Amy. Hi. So you're a language teacher, are you? What's French for shut the door on your way out? <laughs> The exchanges you have on television when you have someone that's cheeky, uh, are those genuine or uh, are listen, those real? Uh, yeah. A contestant has got to do what they've got to do. Yeah. Uh, you know, there was one contestant uh, they yet to show that, they showed it, they broadcast that in uh, uh, England the other day, where he came on and basically said, I'm going to face Sean because he's the worst chaser. Yeah. So that's his view. Uh, three seconds later, uh, three questions later, I knocked him out. Statistically the worst chaser, how do you feel about that? <laughs> I've just played against the worst player I've ever played against. <laughs> Now get off, get off. Statistic, get off. You are the worst player he's played against. Yeah, now get off, go on. Oh, 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 I'm sorry to lose your rom Sam, but you threw down the corner. You give him a hump. Oh, sorry, 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 Brad. You still here? Get off. <laughs> yeah. uh, and he was basically trying to be all apologetic. I said, look, look, just get off, get off, right? But, you know, contestants, are, they're not gratuitously rude or gratuitously offensive. They've got to do what they need to do against a professional quizzer like me. Yeah. And I'm, I, you know, I'm the only chaser who go and see the contestants afterwards, whether they win, uh, whether they lose. Uh, if they win, I'm there to congratulate them. If they lose, I'm there to commiserate because they've come there with nothing and you'll probably leave them with nothing. Yeah. You've put Sasha Distel. Where do you go, go to, to my, my lovely? When, when you're alone in your bed. bed. I can't remember the rest, but... Tell you know. me the sound that's around you. I want to look inside, inside your head. Yes, yes I, I do. do. Yes, I do. Is it true that you sort of live in the same house? Uh, yeah, I've lived in the same... I've been on the same road for the last 59 years. Yeah. And I'm proud uh, to live on that road. Um, I've seen that area sort of... Uh, uh, go from a sort of white, middle-class dominated area to a vast, uh, vibrant, multicultural... Uh, multifaceted uh, area and I'm proud to be uh, representative of that area and to be associated with it so yeah you can only live in one big house at one time you can only drive one nice car at one time yeah. you can only wear one nice uh, pair of suit at one time you, you know so I'm not into excess at all. How have you been able to keep yourself so grounded like you know a lot of people get swept away with the fame and you know what it is I think um, I know what it's like not to have nothing mm. 25 years ago I was Sean Who my life changed exponentially, I suppose, dramatically, uh, when I won Mastermind. With 24 points, 
and no passes. Sean Wallace. It's just that, uh, you know, I'm just sort of, you know, living the dream and fulfilling uh, a dream which I never thought I could actually ever fulfill, but uh, it's real and I'm really enjoying it. It's one of the happiest days of my life, actually. Congratulations. Thank you, Mike. Thank you. <laughs> I remember I sat there, you know, tears of joy running down my face, but I remember the difficult times. I remember the harsh times. And you know what, guess what? Um, the one thing I don't take uh, for granted is fame. Because once you start taking that for granted, once it goes, you don't know what to do with it. Mm. So with me, once I became well known, uh, especially later on in life, I can appreciate what it's like to have nothing. And I'm grateful for what I've got. And as long as I am in the public eye, I'm gonna try and use my fame in an altruistic way uh, to try and help others. Mm. What I love the most about you on the chase is your name, the Dark Destroyer. Like I get it, you know, I'm pr like proud to be black, proud to be coloured. Yeah. Just tell me about the name. Yeah. Well, because uh, you know, there's some people like yeah, oh, you some know. people uh, you know take exception to that. Uh, yeah. uh, Bradley started calling me the Dark Destroyer um, in the second series because I was originally known as, the, I, I still am to this day, known as the Legal Eagle. Yeah. Um, he started calling me the Dark Destroyer, and I don't know if you remember a world champion British boxer called Nigel Ben in the 1990s. Now, he was originally called a Dark Destroyer. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, some people take up uh, umbrage to that. Yeah. I'm proud to be called a Dark Destroyer. I'm dark because I'm black. I destroy people because of my intellect. Is it fun or is it a curse being a uh, walking, talking, like, quiz book? Like, people must come up to you all the time and go, do you know what this is? Yeah, like? as yeah. I say, one of your colleagues just asked me the question in relation <laughs> yeah. to, you know, uh, who made a first phone call in New Zealand. I can't know everything. Yeah. Um, but, you know, we're, if I don't know, I don't know. But you always learn from questions that you don't know yeah. or answers that you don't know. So, um, yeah. I'm always the sort of quizzing Aunt Sally when people come to me, let's see how good you really are. And they'll ask me some obscure question which I stand no chance of answering. And if I don't I know the answer, guess what? It doesn't affect my life in any way, shape or form. And I think like we were quite surprised when we saw you, how, how fit you are. So you got a routine every day? Yeah, every single day. Uh, Have you done it today? Uh, no, because I've just flown in today. Yeah. Uh, but normally I do a, stu a thousand stomach crunches. I get up uh, seven o'clock in the morning. There's an outdoor gym uh, close to where I live. So I, I, I do a 30 minute stint. Um, if I'm not working, then I do another one midday. And I always have a, a trainer who trains me um, in the afternoon. So I keep myself fit. Because I think it's important that uh, you make an investment in relation to your own physical well-being and your own physical health. And it also helps uh, your mental well-being as well. So um, by the time I'm about 80, I want to be able to be uh, as independent as I possibly can in terms of being able to be physically mobile. So I'll continue to do that. I take it you'll probably be someone that never retires? No, yeah. uh, I don't think I ever will. Uh, and I don't see why I should, because sometimes if you slow down, uh, sometimes uh, your sort of drive and determination goes with it. So, you know, I've been self-employed most of my adult working life. Yeah. Uh, so um, long may that continue. Do you get asked for autographs and photos all the time? Well, as I landed into New Zealand today, uh, the minute I went through customs, I was basically mobbed by people. And it's really wonderful yeah. uh, for them to actually recognize who I am. Uh, and as I say, it's my way of saying thank you yeah. to them. Because when people do approach you, they're not offensive. Uh, they ask you in a polite and sort of uh, uh, respectful manner. And uh, I'll always stop and, you know, take a photograph if they want to. Or yeah. All right. Autograph. So I've just got a quick little quiz, but it's a bit different. What do you think happens when you die? What I think happens when I die, um, I, I am a believer that there is a higher power. Yeah. Uh, and uh, I'd like to think that... Uh, if I do die, that um, the life I've lived on Earth will be replicated somewhere else. Mm. So that's what I do believe. What's the meaning of life? Um, I suppose the meaning of life to, is to try and, um, um, you know, we all start off on a level uh, playing field in terms of being born human beings. Mm. Uh, we may not have the same circumstances, uh, but I'm a firm believer uh, that um, you've got one chance in life to be a success. Uh, and um, some people may never have uh, the support in order to actually get that. Uh, but I still think that um, people like me should use their fame in an altruistic way to try and help others up. I'm a firm believer of what I consider to be the ladder of opportunity. You should put that ladder of opportunity down for others to climb up. Mm. So I'm a firm believer if you do have life to try and live it to the best as you possibly can. And what's one regret you wish you could jump in the time machine and go back? Or no I don't have any regrets whatsoever. You know, that's good. You know, I don't have any regrets because, as I say, if you start to have regrets uh, in life, then um, your life, uh, as I say, 
uh, has been an unfil unfulfilled one. Obviously, I've made mistakes in life. You learn from your mistakes. Yeah. Uh, uh, but uh, I I'm pretty uh, pleased the way how my life's turned out so far. I don't take it for granted. Yeah. Uh, and for me, it's all about leaving a legacy uh, behind in terms of um, what I believe in, in terms of trying to inspire people to achieve their own dreams and ambitions. And if my name can resonate down the centuries in relation to that's what Sean Wallace stood for, then uh, my work's done. And just last question, do you ever wake up in the morning and go, man, I've got a good life? Yeah. yeah. And as I say, sometimes I, I wake up and I can't believe how my life's turned out sometimes. Yeah. And I really am grateful for it, how it's turned out. Sometimes I think I'm living in a parallel universe, you know. I'm living this double life whereby this is a Sean Wallace and the, the Sean Wallace of the mundane life, where, you know, oh, yeah. where, uh, you know, is what's really happening to me, but it's not. And uh, I suppose I, I realized that my life had changed the minute I won Mastermind. I was the first black person to apply, let alone go and to win it. Yeah. And when I sat back and realized what I'd achieved, I thought to myself, you know what? The one thing you should never ever do, Sean, is let fame change you. Yeah. And it hasn't, and it never will.